we can start right now yeah good evening uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, opa bsl committee has organized another very uh, successful and very fruitful the timely baby dance seminar on securing child rights protecting children from abuse and neglect children are the concern it's our future generation it's the future of the world we have to protect the children as flowers if we don't protect the next generation we can't think about as a country as a nation or finally we can't think about anything on the earth the today that we have invited the number of eminent uh, speakers from various uh, jurisprudence they are uh, representing uh, the various uh, the professional areas um, i will introduce uh, them when they uh, before they are um, addressing them. may i invite our leader of opa this year the president of the organization of professional association mr saman varusavitan if i introduce mr saman varusavitan he is the president of organization of professional associations of sri lanka this year and he is presently a plant protection and environmental health consultant and the chief executive officer of john piper international private limited a leading pest management and environmental service company he is the current program secretary of sri lanka institute of agriculture he is the current president of the opa may i invite the leader of our leader of organization or professional association uh, to make the welcome address today uh, thank you uh, sunil uh, sunil abiradna our very own uh, senior member of opa our moderator today thanks once again for your kind words and uh, let me welcome all of you who have joined uh, this important webinar uh, we have op and bsl uh, and today's theme is uh, securing child rights protecting children from abuse and neglect as uh, sunil said it's a timely topic and we have to uh, proactively look at all the aspects the all the professional fraternity sri lanka worldwide uh, it's a very important topic um, this is organized uh, association of sri lanka one of our uh, founder member association of organization of professional association established in 1975 by association of sri lanka as being a uh, uh, being a founder association now also producing many past presidents uh, of opa actually have given a great contribution to the professional to this country and the society um, also i we have the first lady secretary uh, general secretary of opa produced by by association of asin dr kosekar and also we have a special committee for by from the by association and opa and uh, i congratulate the studio the hanayaka the stiatlo and our vice president uh, to take the leadership it's been like uh, appointed the chairman of that committee as well to give the better service to this country uh, so with that um, I must say, uh, OPA is the oasis for the critical thinking because we have uh, 52 member associations um, representing uh, 32 professions in this country. I believe it's a unique organization where we have uh, diverse professions meet together, uh, talk together, debate, and come to certain conclusions and bring this knowledge across the country. Across the uh, various strata of uh, 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 people in the society, uh, OPA uh, has been uh, uh, using uh, their uh, committees. Uh, we have a national uh, issues committee, and uh, there are about nine, sixteen uh, standing committees. We present various uh, sectors of the the, the different fields. Uh, this uh, committee, uh, seminars and workshop committee, used to normally uh, hold seminars together with their member associations. So this effort is also one of these efforts that we jointly we give uh, each and every uh, institute uh, association 
to jointly make uh, have seminars in order to educate the professionals and also the society. So today's theme, now we have lineup. Our theme is securing child rights, protecting uh, children from abuse and neglect. Um, uh, in the absence of uh, Mr. Kali, the International President's Council, the uh, <coughs> President of Bar Association, like I must uh, uh, be grateful uh, his leadership and his uh, uh, team uh, to uh, have this initiative. Um, we have the seminar scenes of seminars um, also. And uh, if I uh, give some uh, insights uh, about the uh, uh, the role of uh, OPA, once again, it's actually we were uh, supposed to uh, uh, supposed to give the uh, policy advices to the government. Uh, and in 1975, Dr. Nata Amarakon had this concept and it has light and uh, now we have enriched with 52 associations we have medical architecture um, legal and all the uh, associations uh, actually top level national associations join together in this uh, common platform so um, uh, it's my pleasant task to uh, welcome all of you who have joined here first let me welcome um, uh, uh, the panelists actually speakers today line up. We have five eminent speakers uh, join uh, uh, to uh, make presentations. First, let me uh, let me welcome Professor Mudita Vidana Patirana, Chairman uh, National Child Protection Authority. Welcome, you, sir. Uh, it's an honor to have you in this evening. And uh, Mr. Harshan Anandakar, the former consultant in UNICEF, attorney at law. And we welcome, uh, mostly welcome. And we have here on board uh, uh, Dr. Jean, uh, Professor Jean Pereira, uh, Senior Lecturer, Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. Um, and uh, I, uh, so you are welcome, Madam. Uh, it's an uh, honor to have you here. And uh, I believe that uh, the Honorable Mayor of Colombo, Senator Naika, the former State Minister of Child Affairs, will also join us. He will be on board in a while. And, um, and also, uh, Dr. Ajit Rohan at any at law, uh, Deputy Inspector General of Police and Legal Affairs. He will also join us. Uh, he is not a stranger to us. He has also been uh, with us on many, many occasions. Uh, and um, I must thank, uh, also I welcome our uh, moderator today, uh, Sunil Abirana, Senior Attorney at Law, with also a great personality in the law Asia. Uh, and also a very senior member of uh, OPA as well. And um, Mr. Sujibala Dahanayaka, Vice President of OPA. Um, we welcome all of you. Uh, last but not least, uh, we are, well, this is our attendees. Uh, uh, we all welcome all the attendees, all the members of member associations from Bar Association of Sri Lanka, uh, Medical Fraternity, uh, the OPA, and all other attendees, all distinguished attendees, uh, let me welcome on behalf of Bar Association and uh, Organization of Professional Association. So let me hand over to uh, Mr. Sunil Abheradna, the moderator today, uh, to take on from this onwards. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Saman Varusitarana. Mr. Varusitarana is the leader of the Organization of Professional Association this year. When you talk about security of children rights, or protection of children from abuse and neglect. We can't forget about the legal frame of any country. The legal system will play a major role to protect children's rights. And the legal framework will forward to, uh, to protect children from abuse and neglect. So we have invited a very eminent lawyer, the senior lawyer, to address uh, about this legal framework and the legal provisions relating to this area is Mr. Harshan Anandakar, the senior advisor of and uh, he's a former consultant of UNICEF. He's very familiar to this area. Now, may I invite Mr. Harshan Anandakar? He will address and he will make an assessment 
of the Sri Lanka position in relation to international child protection mechanism. May I invite uh, Mr. Hashranaanakar uh, Reddy Sandhu. Hello, <laughs> good evening to you. Um, evening. I do apologize. I was struggling with my sound, so I only heard your picture all this time. But luckily, I managed to put on the audio at a time that you were mentioning my name. So I hope you can hear me. Yes, now? everything is all right. We can hear you. You can go ahead, Mr. Right. Uh, Mr. Averatna. I do apologize. So. this to introduce myself or is it for my session uh, i have already introduced you because seeing that you are a consultant of right okay fine consultant of unicef and you are that the senior <laughs> attorney at law so and you are one of the best person to address on this subject and you will yeah. address and you will make an assessment of the sri lankan position in relation to international child protection mechanism right now i was actually preparing in order with the uh, title we had that is uh, the improving the level of child rights as well as preventing children from abuse and neglect so this topic was sent to me so i was uh, looking at the international as well as the domestic situation whenever we go to the international level things are a little disappointing because we are have a lot to uh, move through for the international scene but first i would like to make an assessment for all the participants concerned as to the kind of children or the situations we are dealing with is that okay mr veeratna yes sir sure yes, go ahead right so basically what we have we have to figure out what you mean by coming into contact with the law as far as children are concerned in sri lanka children can come into law into contact with the law in three different ways one as need of care and protection as defined by the children's and young persons ordinance secondly as offenders juvenile offenders and thirdly as victims <clears throat> without needing any protection now these are the three different ways that children come into contact with the law in this country now if you take for the first instance the children's and young persons ordinance define a particular set of circumstances that the child is in need the child is considered in need of care and protection and not necessarily a victim of a uh, sexual or other exploitation but inevitably there is some element of that the second ones are the juvenile offenders now the juvenile offenders if you look i mean if you think of with the mindset that they are offenders themselves it's it's not the right way because they themselves are victims because if you look at some of the offenses they are getting caught is for stealing food or something like that so i think it's good for us to consider them also as victims in the broader sense the third ones are the victims of a sexual exploitation but they do not necessarily need care and protection because they have a good family environment now in order to prevent child abuse or neglect i know that we rely a lot on the law we have the criminal law we have the penal code because when it comes to the justice process our focus is mainly on punishing the offender because remember whenever a child has fallen victim the damage to the child is already done but the criminal justice system will punish the offender for committing that crime against the child but will not address the damage that has taken place to the child so in the most successful systems there should be a preventive mechanism in the sense we should spend more focus on how to prevent this from happening so if you uh, mr averatna interrupt me whenever you think i should be interrupted it's okay right so basically when we look at a child in society when children are at risk that is the time the state must pay their attention to if you look at children at risk they are the people for some reason they are about to be separated from the biological family or one of their caregivers prime caregivers are not around say for an example the mother has gone abroad as a domestic worker with the father the father is a drunkard for an example and the child is not safe there now this is a classical at risk situation but our system we only detect a child when the child goes to the police station as a victim to make a complaint we but the thing is if you really look at the village level there are a lot of people and mechanisms 
that we can do to detect. We have midwives, we have grammar sevakas, we have the police can get involved at this stage, some of the officers, I mean village leaders, monks. But our problem is that we can't keep a law enforcement officer at every house to see what's happening with the children. But it's very important to be able to detect when they're at risk stage before the actual abuse takes place. In this way, we should be able to prevent most of the damage being done because remember, once they actually go through the risk of experiencing the abuse, so to speak, I mean, remedial work can be done, but that's not what our focus should be on. That's to punish the offender. So at this level, we have child rights promotion officers, CRPOs by the Department of Probation, who will be involved. So, but what we do not have is proper training for these people to coordinate and detect. Now, I would be very happy, I'm sure the chairman of the NCPA is also with us, that NCPA is ideally suited place to, to, to coordinate such a mechanism. So I feel at a ground level, we are still very weak at detection, and hence we have to wait till a child suffers the damage before our system start addressing them. So what we really need for us to go to an international level is our social work, the preventive work, to reach such a stage that we are able to identify before the actual abuse takes place. Secondly, at risk, when they actually go through the abuse, they become what you call, they are already victimized. At this stage, yes, there's some remedial work that can be done, but the agencies that get caught in this situation is courts, police, JMO, and the probation officer. Here, their more main focus is to punish the offender. So what I would like to see for prevention purposes is to have a mechanism with NCPA at the center to coordinate that we should have a system where from the time the child come into contact with the law, that is mainly the police station, or for that matter, even orphanage, that we have a system of tracking that child till the end of the process, evaluating the entire process. Now, this is one aspect of it. I mean, I would say this is the main aspect I would like to see being improved in this country. And also you would notice when a child rights promotion officers or preventive work is not made into any law, it's not in legislation, even in children's and young persons ordinance, it's after the child has become a victim. There's nothing about preventive work there. So we should move for legislation where preventive work is also given a legal strength, especially the job of the child rights promotion officers. When it comes to courts, the problems you are facing are daunting and they have been problems for the last 10-15 years. That is the serious delay that is caused at the time of hearing the cases. According to research I carried out for NCPA way back in 2010, on average, we did the research for entire district of uh, entire province of Colombo, covering about uh, 12 high courts. What we saw was that an average case of child abuse or neglect will take a minimum of two to three years to be solved. I mean, to be concluded from the date of the offense. When I say solved, not even solved, for at least for the child to give evidence. At least two, three years have lapsed. Some of them are five, six years. The biggest problem at this time is the child doesn't even remember how to give evidence and the general result is acquittals because the child really do not remember after four or five years to give evidence. So delays are a serious issue and they are still prevalent as it, as if it was about 10 years ago. I don't think much has changed on that front. So in the system, from the time the complaint comes, there are bottlenecks. This bottlenecks in the process must be addressed. And I believe that NCPA is aptly suited to carry out this monitoring task by coordinating all these agencies at risk level and after the damage is done. So in this way, the best system of juvenile justice is where no child would come into contact with the law. That's the best system. Not the system where we have the largest number of children's courts or largest number of orphanages. No, that means we have a failed system. Right? That means our system has failed. So what we need, firstly, legalize 
preventing measures and coordinate and train ground level actors in such a way that we can detect at risk children failing which when they're actually abused have a system where the probation officers and crpos coordinate with each other as a case file not pass on from one place to another just as a file number but when you come to courts we have the problem of serious delays so both these aspects collectively are hampering the effective protection of children from neglect and abuse that's my take on the the current situation as far as abuse and neglect goes however the other topic of the other topic was to the child rights their rights now of course we are a signatory country to the icrc the child rights convention and we have managed to pass that iccrp act which i would like to be the section 5 says that whenever the parliament or any government or executive body of person taking a decision must be taking decisions with regard to the best interest of children however although that act is there there are a lot of other outdated laws such as the vagrants ordinance the orphanages ordinance and various other labor regulations which are outdated and we looked into it there has to be a holistic approach one has to be guided by the policies that is set by the icrc which we are a signatory to and then look at individual outdated laws to see how to amend it if necessary completely wipe it off because some of these old laws can be more harmful to children for an example if we take there are a lot of laws for shop and office employees so children are protected but for domestic servants if somebody uses somebody under the age of 18 as a domestic worker there's no law protecting them for an example there's no law protecting them so um it's a huge approach if we want to reach it to the international level then first we must review our domestic legislation to see whether we are in line with international standards so this is my initial um uh, uh briefing so uh, if there's anything more that i miss mr Beratna, i'm quite happy to talk or if there are any questions uh yeah. yes sir thank you very much uh, uh, mr nanakar i think uh, mr nanakar uh, you will agree with me because uh, there's a good development under section 163a of the evidence ordinance uh, correct the video recorder that the uh, evidence this one development compared to other jurisdictions no and, it's uh, it's, a, it's a good development sir but there's a serious problem in that the problem is you see the reason why we are having the video recording as evidence in chief no Yes. that is to avoid the child from coming yes. to court yeah. right and so you don't have to meet your oppressor so to speak but to be cross-examined the child still has to come to court uh, yeah i think uh yeah, yeah Mr. Anakar, we can uh, get some experience from the united states uh, that they are evidence law there are provisions uh, on the distant no, what, what I'm right? like that it's definitely a good move in the right direction but yeah. the intention was if it was to prevent the child from having to come to court the purpose is defeated because the child has to come to court anyway for cross-examination so what yeah. i'm suggesting is why not give evidence via video link that is number one question and secondly how many trials when it comes to juvenile justice have they used this video recording only ncpa has the facility to do so we don't see a single outstation court doing it so law being in the book good a little improvement is needed i mean we can always i mean it's skype and whatsapp and zoom we can always use video link to be cross-examined that is not being done and secondly whatever is in the law is not getting um, really pushed forward uh, in a practical sense these other serious problems we have mr Virat. yeah i totally agree with you in uh, united states uh, and their federal that evidence rules uh, there are provisions because it's high time to that implement uh, these rules uh, even in australia uh, even um, right. Some developed countries that they have introduced their system. I think it's high time to introduce these rules. It, it's high time because the technology is available at a very cheap price now, yes. unlike yes. those days. Yeah. So the only problem is that this is not only this area, but the other areas with high time to introduce these uh, procedural rules adopted by other countries. Definitely. Definitely. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nanaikara. Uh, you are the valuable uh, contribution. Uh, our uh, next speaker. In fact, I don't need to introduce uh, 
even because she's a well-known and a figure in Sri Lanka. Uh, Ms. Rosie uh, Senanayaka, uh, Justice of Peace. Uh, is a Sri Lankan uh, politician, a famous uh, politician, a former uh, Mrs., uh, Mrs. World, uh, beauty queen, and also an activist. She is current the mayor of Colombo and former prime minister spoke, uh, spokesperson and the deputy head of the prime minister's office for uh, Mr. Ranil Vikramasinghe. She has been an activist on several issues and an active figure in the opposition gaining much limelight. Rosie Senanayaka was the former state minister for child development under uh, His Excellency President Maitri Pala Sirisena. She was also the leader of the opposition in Western Provincial Council and the chief organizer of United National Party for the Colombo West electorate. Ms. Senanayaka has served as a Sri Lankan High Commissioner for Malaysia and was a goodwill ambassador for the United Nations Population okay. Fund. The she will identify the obstacles for the implementation of an effective child protection policy. May I invite Ms. Senanayaka to address the discussion? Um, good evening. Thank you very much for inviting me to uh, speak on this uh, session. But unfortunately, I have to like you know attend a meeting in the next ten minutes. Um, but um, I think I agree with. Um, I mean, if if I'm to like you know basically cut uh, some of the things that uh, I was actually going to speak and uh, speak on one uh, issue that uh, uh, Mr. Harshan and Anna kind of mentioned about you know uh, taking evidence on uh, video and not uh, allowing the child or exposing the child to a courtroom, uh, which can be very uh, a, a traumatic thing for a child. Um, that's one of the um, issues that we have been debating on and we have very limited facilities with regards to that kind of, uh, uh, you know, taking evidence or, you know, recording a child's uh, statement. Uh, of course, when we talk about children, children are the most important um, species uh, in the world. And uh, when we talk about child rights, we talk about the child's, uh, from child's uh, education, from early childhood or uh, uh, childhood education, uh, their nutrition, and the most important thing is protection. Uh, whether we actually provide the protection that a child needs in today's society is very questionable. We have been uh, debating and going back and forth with regards to, uh, you know, bringing uh, proper laws to protect uh, kids in the country. One might say that we uh, we have adhered to the norms of the child, con the international child conventions, uh, and. Practically, we have ratified all the UN conventions and treaties and whatever when we talk about child protection. But um, locally, we have been debating on the child rights bill. And into this bill, what uh, we actually need to uh, bring in. Uh, there have been talks and dialogues. I have been out of the ministry for the last five years, so I really don't know exactly the process, uh, the, the, sorry, the um, uh, progress of the child rights bill. Uh, what has been added and what hasn't been added and what uh, needs to be added. Uh, this is something that we need to basically uh, debate and uh, discuss on how uh, we need to move forward because what we see is from the time that we have been talking about, you know, basically protecting our kids and giving them the right environment, uh, a free uh, environment for them to grow as children. Um, we have seen many a cases then the, in the past where children are being abused, children are being abused in various forms, whether it's uh, mentally, verbally, or physically, uh, and where children go through from, you know, uh, rape to, uh, you know, practically everything that is unhealthy for a child, any, everything that is unhealthy for any human being to grow uh, under those uh, circumstances. So uh, this is, this is I'm, I'm, first of all, I would like to, you know, basically congratulate the Bar Association uh, for making this an important topic, and it's a very timely topic, and uh, we need to, you know, basically not only consult the legal fraternity, we need to consult communities, community-based, um, you know, uh, people who work on the ground with regards to children, women, uh, women of all strata, women in different parts of the country, because uh, uh, when we talk about child right, whether it's nutrition, education, or protection, uh, these vary from uh, district to city to, uh, you know, uh, provinces. So, you know, we need to actually look at all these elements 
uh, before we look at the bigger picture of how we need to formulate the right child protection, um, you know, bill, or you know, take into consideration exactly uh, what we need to uh, look at uh, when it comes to, um, uh, you know, safeguarding the, the next generation or the kids. Uh, I would also suggest that you know there have been women on the ground. There have been. Uh, people, women and men on the ground, uh, who have been working tirelessly with regards to child protection. Uh, we need to bring some of these people into the conversation, into a dialogue, to see exactly through their experiences and their learnings that what needs to be uh, put in uh, as you know, laws are concerned. Now, for an example, I know when um, Natasha Balendra uh, worked as the um, uh, Child uh, Protection Authority chairperson, uh, Marini de Oliveira. You know, there have been some vibrant personalities that have been working with regards to child protection uh, and, you know, holding position in, positions in these key institutions. And they have a basic idea and a good idea of exactly what uh, systems or what structures we need to put in uh, to, you know, look at a better future for our kids and to protect our kids. So uh, maybe we need, you know, more than bring politicians like me uh, who, who are, I mean, I'm a person who is really passionate about uh, women and children, and that's, you know, for me is um, my uh, biggest, I would say, mandate in life uh, to bring people also who have worked on the ground, uh, who have a basic idea of, you know, exactly what needs to come into uh, these um, instruments, uh, the, the instruments that we need to create uh, into this dialogue. As, by saying that, I also need to ask you to, you know, allow me to, to leave this forum right now because I have to attend a very important uh, meeting since it's, you know, the Columbus City is very crucial with regards to the uh, present COVID pandemic and uh, the situation that we are faced with. Uh, so thank you very much, Mr. Abhiratna, for inviting me. I would like to be of assistance at uh, your next meetings and, you know, uh, webinars. Um, and thank you once again. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Senanayaka. We know that uh, with your busy schedules, attend to this uh, our discussion. Uh, we really uh, appreciate uh, your contribution here. Uh, Ms. Senanayaka, before you leave, may I ask uh, one question? In Japan, uh, they have Motanai uh, movement, the children are concerned. Uh, have we uh, discussed anything uh, at the parliamentary level or any other that uh, level at the authorities uh, to implement uh, the concept like Motanai movement uh, in Japan, uh, to how to protect the children? She, uh, and the children are concerned concept, Ms. Senanayaka. Uh, there have been many discussions actually with regards to uh, different formulations uh, uh, together with UNICEF uh, and other institutions uh, that work with regards to child and child rights and child protection. Uh, you know, uh, we've been discussing on um, child education, whether it's, you know, early childhood education, uh, because building brains for building future, building brains is building future, you know, uh, you know, from, from education to nutrition to uh, also the safety, safety in the house, safety outside the house, all that has been discussed and there are many, um, we have, we've done uh, research and there are reports. UNICEF together with a lot of the local uh, institutions that are working with regards to children have done many studies and come up with many strategies. Uh, I remember Building Future, Building Brains and Building Future program, which in my opinion, uh, I feel that um, uh, is an absolutely timely uh, program that we need to put into uh, the early childhood development program uh, was presented by UNICEF uh, to the then uh, finance minister, Mr. Mangala Samaravira. But I really don't know once they do the studies and once they, once they make the presentations and you know people seem to be very interested in moving forward uh, and you know making changes with its mindset and attitude changes, uh, whether, you know, they, they move forward or whether it's, you know, basically there and nothing happens after all these presentations are made. I, I need to really go back and, you know, vis revisit uh, these uh, programs and see exactly where they are. Uh, I have for the last three, three years almost been very busy being the mayor and running uh, the Colombo municipality. So I haven't really looked into, you know, some of those issues that we've been working. Uh, obviously, those institutions have taken, carried on with the work that they've been doing. So, uh, I, I cannot uh, answer your question directly until I, you know, go back and revisit and see whether we are uh, doing something on the same lines as Japan. Yes, I mean, and I got 30 years back, the Japanese started this movement. I think we are not late that we can, at least now we can implement that. 
thank you very much uh, ms zena thank you thank you thank you for inviting now our uh, next speaker uh, may i um, invite our uh, professor uh, jean perera uh, if i introduce uh, professor ms jean perera yes yes very long uh, that uh, curriculum vitae um i will briefly that some i will try my best to introduce uh, within very short period uh, professor ms jean perera is a accredited uh, senior teacher in higher education at the university of colombo with uh, seda uk accreditation 2018 with a professor of uh, forensic medicine and toxicology at the chair department of uh, forensic medicine and toxicology the faculty of medicine university of colombo sri lanka she is a product of uh, university of colombo and she uh, obtained mbbs university of colombo second class honors for third mbbs and in 1990 she got diploma in legal medicine post graduate institute of medicine pgim in 1992 august md in forensic medicine post graduate institute of medicine 1994 july diploma in medical jurisprudence pathology uh, london uh, united kingdom in 1994 diploma in medicine jurisprudence La london united kingdom in 2016 to 2017 accredited senior teacher in higher education the university of colombo with seda uk accreditation 2018 a professional experience as a chair professor department of uh, forensic uh, medicine and toxicology the faculty of medicine colombo <coughs> honorary consultant judicial medical officer pgim board certified specialist in uh, forensic medicine uh, course director the diploma in forensic medicine diploma let investigation member of various educational and uh, service committees and uh, this is uh, international forensic medicine service function in the fiji islands 2009 to 2010 and guy st thomas hospital london bridge uh, uk from 1993 to 1994 She has prepared number of commission reports, various reports on forensic practice guidelines, the resource persons and coordinator of several seminars and symposia, resource person for training programs for police officers on forensic medicine for the investigation of crime, resource person for training program for state council organized by the attorney general department. Um, Professor Jean Perra, today that she will address on the subject of child trauma. experienced by abused and neglected children this is very very important area considered today's country so may i invite professor jean perra to address on it madam you have to your mic uh, mic is mute yes son can you hear me now yes yeah, yes right thank you thank you very much mrs munila biratna for that introduction and uh, i really thank the opa as well as the bar association for in inviting me to this webinar which is very important to us as a country uh, because children as someone said are, are are the real value of a country and the future lies with them so i will straight away go to the uh, go to my uh, presentation um i will not try to make this uh, sort of academic exercise but here we are sort of having a multi uh, multi uh, pronged approach to child abuse especially its prevention so um, basically we must not forget there are several types of child abuse as mentioned earlier physical abuse sexual abuse and also emotional abuse which sometimes we don't realize and then uh, child neglect um now uh, just to take a look at the type of offenders uh, so, you know often the parents may be the offender because you know there may be corporal punishment and then we have teachers as the offenders and sometimes the older siblings may be the offenders and uh, unfortunately some of our religious leaders uh, also may be the offenders then when we consider sexual abuse perpetrators most often the stranger being a perpetrator is is uncommon it can happen but it is uncommon often the perpetrator is a person very well known to the child or the parents or the guardians so 
so there is what is called grooming of the child for sexual abuse uh, and later only the abuse happens so that is why when the, if the parents are aware of where where the child is moving to whom the child uh, relates and with whom the child is close then uh, some of this can be prevented but then the other thing that what research evidence shows is that opportunity opportunity <coughs> for the child to be alone with the perpetrator has often resulted in this kind of um, sexual abuse then unfortunately again we have teachers uh, who are the perpetrators and again they favor the child and win the confidence of the child so this is from the experience that we have gathered by examining these victims of uh, child uh, abuse uh, then uh, coming to effects of uh, uh, child abuse now the unfortunate things thing is uh, effects of child abuse are not only short term it can be really long term and it can uh, really adapt Uh, affect the adult life as well. It can crop up uh, at any time of the life. Uh, sometimes, say just after the abuse, there may not be much symptoms, but it may the symptoms may come uh, even one year later. Uh, so this is the sad thing about child abuse. So physical child abuse, of course, we have injuries. Sometimes you come across fractures, and the most dangerous thing is there is the risk of causing death. Uh, from time to time we come across cases where we have uh, missed the yeah someone is asking in the chat what is the difference between offender and perpetrator uh, well i'm just losing using this loosely so for for my purposes of my lecture uh, because i thought if the perpet name perpetrator is not familiar then offender will be uh, more suitable so there is no such distinction on my part so um coming back to the effects now one major effect is um one major effect is uh, uh, major risk is that there is this potential risk of death because even the sing, uh, first episode of uh, physical child abuse we have to treat it seriously because there is a possibility that they may uh, that death may result of course it is a smaller percentage but still uh, a child death as a result of abuse uh, by a guardian is unacceptable uh, to society on the other hand physical abuse um, i mean now we talk a lot about sexual abuse but on the other hand physical child abuse is uh, quite common and we see only the tip of the iceberg only the very severe cases will come into light so someone was mentioning that we have to do a risk assessment of the children in the uh, grassroots level i think that is a very good idea and uh, i think systems are in place in most of the peripheral places for example i have uh, from my experience not as a judicial medical officer but as a researcher in the uh, say the hilly areas like hatton uh, there are these women's committees which can be empowered to uh, in order to detect um, cases possible cases Uh, since we have all the officers like this child right promotion officers so that kind of uh, system uh, can be empowered then um, uh, another question i i was wondering is are we sometimes missing child deaths due to violence uh, so this is um, for example say infant deaths uh, that can be loosely referred to as aspiration uh, milk aspiration that does happen sometimes but then uh, that is why this type of death it is better to be the autopsy to be done by a consultant judicial medical officer then uh, long term uh, psychological and physical effects are seen like poorly adjusted to society and very poor self esteem on the other hand sexual abuse child sexual abuse uh, has much more serious effects and uh, they have they suffer from this Uh, throughout life throughout adult life unless measures have not been taken because uh, sexuality uh, when there is sexual abuse the child feels that the child has no control over his or her own body again there is distrust of people because as i told earlier often it is someone close to the child so the child distrusts those who are uh, close to him 
and as a result of that they children can even uh, sort of uh, fall apart with their own parents uh, so this is a very real risk and there is low self esteem another very um, important thing is um, teenage pregnancies uh, we have to take uh, all measures to prevent teenage uh, pregnancies now on the other hand some of these symptoms may be um, seen outward outwardly what we call externalized but the danger is when they are internalized then only they cannot uh, progress through adult life because their development is uh, stopped or stalled at an early age and they still think like a child and they their decision making is poor self esteem is poor so this is a very uh, real menace to society that is why um, this kind of child should be rehabilitated properly uh, so that the society um, will will not be a, a sick society um so i will not go into great detail about the symptoms and all that but just to highlight that sometimes child abuse victims can suffer from major depressive disorders also substance abuse that is drug addiction is a very common complication of child sexual abuse then um, so that is why i say rehabilitation of a uh, child victim, uh, victim of abuse is a good investment so that they can become a good uh, product a productive person member of the society then we must not neglect emotional abuse uh, for example constant nagging of the child uh, using abusive language often uh, due to the parent being an alcoholic parent there is this vicious circle of uh, abusing the child so that again the child does not gain independence and there is uh, low is uh, low self esteem maternal deprivation syndrome that is maternal deprivation syndrome that is there is inadequate bonding with the mother or uh, sometimes we see when the mother is not available so this kind of uh, defects also can uh, affect the child emotionally now not only that in our society what about the school environment uh, aren't there teachers who can be who, can, who are the cause of emotional abuse for the child there are so many cases and i'm sure many children are not coming up with the complaints because i feel um children also like the women uh, not empowered enough to come forward and make these uh, complaints now it's good if it stops at least at the uh, school level but what about the university even in the universities you can have Uh, these uh, adults speaking abusive language and these children the university students also today i saw a post where a university student has uh, commented about this abusive language that is simply not on so as a society we have to take a stand of zero tolerance uh, towards uh, this kind of abuse then um, going on to the role of a judicial medical officer uh, now judicial medical officers in sri lanka are the first contact healthcare professionals for these abused victims therefore we have a great responsibility although our primary goal is to collect forensic evidence uh, we have other roles as well what i believe and uh, you no know, even the um, history given by the child the uh, record of what happened we call the narrative itself is a very good piece of evidence because we assume that the child ch uh, children do not lie um, but going beyond that evidence collection jmo judicial medical officer uh, can be the person who initiates the healing of the child by being a good listener by having good communication skills and then we have the uh, infrastructure development should be there because the child should not come to a, the abused child should not be abused again in the uh, environment where the doctor examines uh, then um, of course i am i am speaking not so much on prevention but on how we uh, handle the abused child but remember um, now our role is to stop further abuse so in a in a a uh, sense that is prevention so stopping further abuse and making sure that the perpetrator uh, gets punished uh, then uh, when we are doing this we have to be mindful about 
um, the victims' rights and uh, what about the Victims Protection Act, uh, information to be provided, privacy, confidentiality, autonomy, consent formation, and all that. And um, so those are a few of the things that the JMOs can do. And from what we have gathered in our experience with these children, um, um, at times the system does not work. Now, for example, uh, there was one eight-year-old child who had come to our uh, unit two years later uh, with three abuse. What had happened is we had done our role, but the probation and the police had not followed up the child and the child was getting abused again and again in the same environment. And fortunately, we had what is called the case conference that the judicial medical officers are having. And then uh, again, the probation and the police came into the picture and uh, we had to remove uh, the, after the case conference, the child was removed from the, that unsafe environment and he, she was put into a uh, safe house because the, even the mother refused to take on the child she had married again and had another child from that husband. So these are the real problems at um, at uh, grassroots level. So I think a case conference needs to have the legal sanction because I don't think that that is uh, there is any provision uh, for that in our legal system. Um, then creating awareness by publishing about this. Now, for example, some children can present with uh, varied symptoms. Uh, so other doctors have to be made aware, for example, they come with abdominal pain, maybe a urine infection. Uh, so of course they refer to, a, to the judicial medical officer for an opinion. Teachers have to be empowered and teachers have to be made aware how to detect this child abuse. I think that is happening uh, from many of the organizations, including the National Child Protection Authority, because many cases, the children, uh, when the school performance is uh, low, uh, low, the teacher detects it and somehow interviews the child and gets hold of this um, abusive uh, history. Then, um, a message from JMOs to society, what I think is parenting skills. Do we have any programs for uh, parenting skills for parents, at least for those parents who feel inadequate? Now, uh, good parenting will, may, uh, will uh, make the child trust the parent so much that the, uh, that the child will come to the parent and complain about the abuse. Otherwise, the abuse can go on for many years. And only later on, when there are gross effects, it will come into uh, like then regarding sex, uh, sexual abuse i personally feel sex education early in life to be taught in school is very important in fact some some teachers are reluctant to teach about the reproductive system i was asked by international school whether i could come and teach about uh, the reproductive system i mean we can't be doing this every day so i think that is also something to be addressed and also uh, these technological advances has uh, has its own um, uh, evil. For example, most of the time, sexual abuse, uh, child sexual abuse of a 15 year old girl by a say a 21 or 22 year old man, uh, the relationship started with a text message. I think most of the JMOs will have these stories to tell. So um, we have to address this in some way or the other. And before I finish off, uh, I think one more word about treatment. It is very complex and there should be dedicated psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, because it's a complex thing and parents should be involved in the rehabilitation. Uh, and uh, this has to be taken seriously by the child psychiatrist. There are some people who are really dedicated to this, but sometimes people can uh, think of this as a burden. So having said that, I think, um, because of time restrictions, Mr. Sunil Abhiratna, I think uh, I will stop now. And if there are any questions. Uh, uh, maybe if you like, you can go ahead another five minutes, you can. Uh, really? you have... so, yeah. So actually, I was thinking about this treatment because I, I am not a psychologist or a psych psychiatrist. But just to say that I, I don't have that expertise. But just to say that near one or two interviews with the child who has been abused will not... Um, will not rehabilitate the child. Now, people may say now, I think that I'm not speaking so much about prevention, but then now if this child is to not, not rehabilitated properly, we are putting out a, a deranged child who cannot make decisions, who has low self-esteem and will not contribute uh, well to society. And the other thing is 
not all, but some of these abused children can, can uh, because they are not well adjusted, can abuse their own children. So this can be what is called a generational um, defect. So I think we owe it to society to rehabilitate these children and uh, look after them uh, to that effect. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Jean Perra. Uh, normally, that uh, we know only that when you, tell, when you uh, say it's a child abuse, it's a physical abuse and mental abuse. Now, Madam, you will explain what is scientific classification uh, on this uh, child abuse. It's very important uh, as far as this child abuse is concerned. Yes. And uh, then the society can understand the situation of the child uh, that very well under, with, with this classification. Yes. Uh, so once again, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Jean Perra. Our next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Ajit Rohana. Uh, Dr. Ajit Rohana is the Deputy Inspector General, Legal and Discipline and Conduct of uh, Sri Lanka Police. Uh, prior to his uh, current assignment, he served as DIG, Traffic DIG Western Province, Police Media Spokesman, Director, Police Legal Division, and a Director, Sri Lanka Police Academy. He's obtained his Bachelor of Law, LLB, uh, from the Open University of Sri Lanka, and uh, Master of Law, LLM, from the University of Colombo. And he's an attorney at law as well. Uh, he has attended many workshops on legal and policing related matters in Sudan, Thailand, and Nepal. Dr. Ajit Rohana is the only Sri Lankan police officer who addressed the session of the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva in 2016, representing Sri Lanka. He has uh, presented research papers titled Criminal Justice System, Lawyer and uh, Police, Challenges Faced by Law Enforcement Authorities in Combating Drug Menace and uh, Police Powers Under Excise Ordinance at a couple of international and local conferences. Dr. Ajit Rohana is also an author of few books such as combating torture, challenges, and prospect to Sri Lanka police, laws concerning commercial sex and prevention, Odyssey of uh, Professional Excellency, and uh, Police Training Manual of uh, Human Rights. Dr. Ajit Rohana, uh, Deputy Inspector General and Attorney at Law, that he will address on the practical problems faced by the police in enforcing child protection law. May I invite uh, Dr. Ajit Rohana? Yeah. Good evening, uh, Mr. Sunil Abhiratna. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, all the participants. So I have the pleasure in conducting this presentation uh, on um, uh, especially uh, the practical problems faced by the police in respect of uh, child abuse cases. Uh, so before that, I would like to make a small introduction about uh, Sri Lanka police uh, and uh, our dedication in order to eradicate uh, crimes against uh, children. Sri Lanka police was established by the British rulers, um, initially by the Dutch rulers in 1753. Then thereafter, British rulers, they re-established uh, the Sri Lankan uh, police organization. So however, in uh, 1865, Sri Lankan police department was established by the British rulers. So as of today, uh, we, have, uh, we have completed uh, almost uh, 154 years and we have 42 territorial divisions and 56 functional divisions. So what I, I mean, uh, explain to you about this uh, history because there is a rationale uh, behind the police history and the offenses against uh, children. Uh, we have 42 territorial divisions, uh, just like uh, Gaul, Matara, Tangol, uh, Candy, Jaffna, KKs, like that. And each and every uh, territorial division uh, is uh, managed by a senior superintendent of police or, or heading a senior superintendent of police or a, a superintendent of police. Under their command, there are ASPs and officers in charge of police stations. Uh, as of today, we have 400, 494 uh, uh, territorial police stations in the country. So till 1998, we didn't have a, a specific mechanism in order to deal with 
the offences against children. But in 1998, the Sri Lanka, uh, the, the, the Children and Women Bureau of Sri Lanka Police was uh, established uh, and it was expanded. And apart from that, uh, then thereafter, in, in 2009, the Territorial Children and Women Bureau units were established. So we have 42 Territorial Children and Women uh, Investigation Bureau units. And apart from that, the Central Investigation Bureau. And in addition to that, every and each police station of the country, we have as I mentioned, 494 police stations. So every and each police station has a unit called Children and Women Bureau. So, so all the, the officers in charge of these units uh, are female police officers. So our female card is approximately, uh, approximately 9,000. So out of that, uh, we have deployed uh, 4,500 female officers to children, women bureau, investigation units, and other institutions. So what are the, 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 the challenges we are facing or what are the problems we are facing? Ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, the key, key international instrument in respect of uh, offenses against uh, uh, children uh, and uh, uh, their activities, uh, their uh, uh, safeguards and all uh, these uh, issues is the uh, United Nations Convention on the Right of the Rights of the Child. So the United Nations Convention, it is called UNCRC. So this was uh, signed by the United Nations uh, in 1989, and uh, it came into force uh, on the 2nd of September 1990. So since 1990, uh, to date, it has been completed almost 30 years. So this is the key international instrument that deals with the rights of the, the children. So the main, main issue or the problem, practical problem that we are facing is the, the, the contents of uh, the international in instrument. Uh, have we incorporated all the contents of the international instrument to the domestic law. So in 1995, an amendment was brought to the, the penal court after uh, 100, 113 years, and some of the, the, the main salient points, provisions, contents of the UNCRC um, have, had, were incorporated to our uh, domestic legal system by Act Number 22 of 1995, uh, uh, means which means the, the the penal court amendment and again 2006 and other amendment was brought by the legislator uh, to the principal enactment of penal court uh, some provisions uh, have been incorporated so however uh, however uh, the uncrc was introduced in 19, 1990 and apart from that another protocol was introduced by the united nations but all the contents of the, the, the convention have not been incorporated into the domestic law. So therefore, uh, many speakers, uh, Sri Lankans, NGOs, the representatives, they are trying to compare our standards, our legal standards, along with the, 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 the legal standards of other countries. But, uh, but according to this particular uh, issue uh, every time it is not compatible with uh, with the uh, international uh, best practices and our law but uh, we have taken considerable steps in order to ensure the child rights and the sri lanka police have been uh, dedicated uh, since to uh, 19, 19, uh, uh, 98 uh, to protect uh, child rights but uh, the, uh, this problem, the legal legal challenge is one of the challenges we are facing because uh, as you all know, the majority of uh, crimes at the moment committed uh, in the cyberspace. 
um, using various type of uh, 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 social uh, media websites, accounts. So therefore, um, we have, uh, on the other hand, we have a technological challenge. Technological challenge, because sometimes the, the, the perpetrators, uh, they are operating from foreign countries. They are operating from foreign countries. Uh, then they are after especially a child pornography and apart from that uh, so sexual harassments all the all the the crimes that have been defined in our law uh, are committed through the internet on one hand uh, our, we don't have uh, capacity to conduct for the investigation because sometimes that uh, particular offender is in uh, a foreign country but on the other hand uh, still we have 100% uh, i mean skilled officers in order to conduct such crimes so that is uh, the second problem that we are facing uh, in order to conduct criminal investigation and the apart from that uh, as you all know ladies and gentlemen uh, the media challenge is the, the one of the biggest challenges that we are facing uh, problems that we are facing uh, i as i mentioned an amendment was brought to the uh, the an amendment was brought to the penal code in uh, in 1995 act number 22 uh, uh, a new section was introduced to the principal enactment that is section 365 c so according to that section it is categorically mentioned uh, publication of matter relating to certain offenses Whoever prints or publishes, so I would like to read that section partly. Whoever prints or publishes the name or any matter relating which may make known the identity of any person against the certain whom an offense under section 345, 360A, 360B, 363 or 364A, uh, 365, there are certain offenses in respect of. Um, uh, I mean, sexual offenses. So, if a person is publishing, so it has the section doesn't mention whether it is uh, in the the electronic media or print more print media. Uh, sometimes, I mean, the it, it can, it can uh, I mean, cover the both uh, sites, print media and electronic media. It is an offense. It is an offense. The punishment is two year rigorous imprisonment with the Fine. But the problem is, especially when we investigate uh, cases, the local reporters, the local media reporters, they go to the scene and they get various voice cuts. And in the evening news, it is published. So on one hand, it is a problem. It's a, it's a problem, a stigma and discrimination in respect of the victim. Because if she's a school girl on the following day, because no one knows this particular incident, but it is published uh, uh, on media, and on the following day she cannot go to school, and everyone knows it, and the, the she is marginalized uh, in the school by the other students. So two incidents have been report, reported in this nature, and on the other hand, these publications are directly affected to the trial. Uh, the defense lawyers, they can get all these video clips and apart from that, they, the paper articles and they can contradict the, 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 the witness or the witness credibility at the trial. So therefore, this is one of the biggest problems that we are facing. As you all know, if you monitor, there are researchers, I think, uh, who are listening to this presentation, my speech, and they can conduct a research. So you, you, you can conduct a research at least for a period of one month from today or tomorrow. So watch evening news, but these days, sometimes this all this COVID-19 news, uh, they are published. But, uh, but generally, uh, regularly, almost all the media, all the newspapers, they published and that particular news article or the, or the electronic media news uh, discriminates the, the victim and apart from that, it is badly affected to the criminal justice system or the trial. 
Uh, and in addition to that, what I need to uh, mention is, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as we have a, a very old, outdated enactment that is called Children and Young Persons Ordinance. This ordinance was introduced by the British rulers in 1939. It means um, 81 years ago. 81 years ago, this particular enactment uh, was introduced by the British rulers. Now, according to the provisions of this uh, uh, enactment, the juvenile justice system is established. So, what is some juvenile justice system? So, the, this is, uh, I mean, the short name is uh, CYPO, Children and Young Persons Ordinance. So, 81 years have been completed since the enactment of that, but still we have, um, uh, uh, we have an outdated juvenile justice system. So, if you go to a foreign country, developed country, so how the courthouses, special courthouses have been established in order to um, hear the, the, the child abuse cases or the, um, the offenders of children. And apart from that, the modern technology is used. And apart from that, if a child offender is convicted or if child offender is remanded, so there are places, very uh, methodical places in those countries to deal with child offenders. But uh, in our country, on one hand, the, we have a problem with the legal system. Again, the, the juvenile justice system laws that are embodied in the uh, CYPO. So I have been in the legal field, being the director legal, DIG legal, for a long period, almost 10 years now. And uh, we have several discussions, and the justice ministry is trying to uh, bring an amendment so the various intellectuals so are, they are imparting their knowledge and contributing. So, however, still after 81 years, uh, we uh, stay with uh, this uh, outdated legal legislative enactment. So, immediate amendment should be brought to the CYPO because uh, I believe my classmate, my friend, uh, Professor Mudita Vidana Patirna is listening this. So, you are the the, the the chairman of NPC. So Mudita uh, was appointed very recently, but uh, we need to look into this issue because uh, because uh, if the, uh, the, the CYP, uh, YPO is not amended, then there is a, especially there is a lacuna in the procedural law, procedural legal system in, res in respect of children. So that lacuna should be fulfilled. And in addition to that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the other problems that we are facing is uh, logistical problems. So sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, uh, there are provisions in the, uh, in the criminal procedure, procedure code that uh, uh, at the trial, uh, when, I mean, evident, when uh, the witness should not be uh, uh, called to the top and uh, a video recorded uh, uh, footage uh, could be displayed in front of the accused. And thereafter, if he needs to, I mean, uh, raise uh, questions at the cross-examination, then there is a mechanism. But uh, this, uh, this particular, I think day before yesterday, uh, a meeting was convinced by the National convinced by the the uh, National Police Commission also uh, in this regard, and all the stakeholders uh, attended this meeting. So we need to streamline the system, uh, and uh, apart from that, uh, our courthouses also should be equipped with uh, this particular instrument instruments uh, required instruments. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so we are talking of uh, child abuse cases and we are talking of uh, 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 child offenders. But every time we are talking of investigations, prosecutions, uh, and apart from that, filing planes, government analyst reports, the, the reports of forensic experts, judicial medical officers, delaying of uh, all these reports, everything. But 
still we don't have a proper mechanism in order to prevent these uh, crimes against children. So it should uh, generally, I mean, my personal perception, and, uh, uh, and I have 30 years of experience in the um, law enforcement uh, mechanism, so everyone should contribute that. So it is not the sole responsibility of the pol police. It is not the sole responsibility of the National Child Protection Authority. It is not the sole responsibility of the probation officers, the probation department, but uh, this is everyone's responsibility. Since uh, his or her childhood, uh, this particular concept uh, should be inculcated, uh, should be inculcated and, uh, uh, and uh, in our school system, uh, especially the religious leaders, the teachers, the parents, uh, uh, the guardians of children. So everyone uh, is having a responsibility uh, in this regard. So therefore all the stakeholders, including parents and teachers, so they should contribute in order to prevent uh, uh, crime against uh, children. Uh, and I have observed that uh, uh, in our law, there are two types of, there are three types of rapes. So one is generally conventional rape. Uh, and apart from that, statutory rape. And apart from that, marital rape. So, but uh, generally the, the statutory rape is uh, directly uh, connected to the offenses again against children. Uh, if we analyze the statistics, the rape statistics in Sri Lanka, uh, statutory rapes uh, statistics in Sri Lanka, the children, they have given their consent to their lovers or boyfriends. Then thereafter, they have been sexually harassed or raped or abused. Then what happened is, I mean, all the complaints in respect of these stat statutory rape cases are not reported to the police station. Then thereafter, if it is reported, so we conduct investigations. We conduct investigations, so sometimes, uh, so generally, uh, the, the, these are not the cases that are heard by the magistrate courts. The cases are going to high court, and generally it takes five to seven uh, years to conclude cases. So during this period, so sometimes that particular girl, she would be at the age of 25, 27, 28, sometimes 30. So then again, there are plenty of social problems uh, that are arising. And uh, constantly they, I mean, initially they make complaints or the parents, they make complaints to police stations, but uh, on the other hand, after two, three years time, they are coming to withdraw the case. But we don't have any legal provisions to uh, withdraw this type of cases. So by that time, sometimes Honorable Attorney General has filed indictments in High Court. Then again, they cannot, uh, they cannot uh, have a marriage uh, on one hand, but on the other hand, uh, sometimes two or three times per day, they need to come to so, so then this is also a, a very big problem that we are facing. Uh, most of the victims, most of the complainants, they come to police stations because of this long delay. But we should not criticize, we should not blame anybody, any institution, because our courthouses, our judiciary are having plenty of cases, plenty of ca cases. So that is the problem. But a special mechanism should be established. Uh, to hear cases in respect of uh, uh, children. So those are my suggestions, ladies and gentlemen, and especially uh, 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 Sri Lanka police, uh, every time uh, uh, instruct our subordinate officers to uh, deal with uh, issues of uh, uh, children and women in a methodical way, and we have trained uh, several officers, almost all the female officers uh, holding the rank of sub-inspector above. They have been given uh, a special trainings. And in addition to that, uh, uh, especially in the Northern and Eastern provinces, 
we have deployed female officers uh, uh, i mean who are uh, familiar with the uh, tamil language because uh, language barrier is one of the main problems uh, uh, in this issue so therefore if a, if a, if a victim uh, of uh, uh, jaffna or vaunia or kalmuna or ampara or samantura um, she can come to the police station and she she can make uh, her complaint in uh, her own language so that mechanism has been uh, created but uh, uh, we are conducting several um, tamil training programs uh, uh, at our training uh, institute uh, uh, mayangana so mayangana training institute uh, has been uh, i mean specially established in order to train uh, singalese police officers for tamil language so the female officers also attending uh, uh, i can say uh, if you go to a, a police station in northern and eastern part of the country so you can record your complaint bilingually either in singala or tamil but uh, uh, i cannot say um, if a, a tamil victim go to a police station in other areas some police stations they have the capacity but they cannot uh, make their complaint in their own language so uh, we have identified this problem and we have a mechanism to resolve this problem uh, and we are going to recruit more and more uh, tamil speaking uh, female police officers from uh, uh, especially uh, northern and eastern part of the country to sri lankan police service to uh, resolve this problem especially female officers uh, from uh, those two provinces so those are the the main issues uh, we are having uh, ladies and gentlemen and uh, detention places as i mentioned earlier uh, if a child offender is remanded uh, everyone uh, uh, is raising this uh, question so sometimes if a, if, a, if a ch that child offender might be a girl or child offender might be a boy but sometimes uh if she is detained for a period of one month two months uh, time in that particular uh, uh, place so automatically her behavior uh, is changed and uh, sometimes uh, she or he is converted to uh, a criminal or um, a person with criminal attitudes so therefore uh, the stakeholder should think of this uh, and uh, i have visited uh, several remand prisons uh, in respect of children in foreign countries so they are just like uh, uh, bungalows uh, so we need to have that type of infra infrastructure even though he is a child offender so these are the remarks um, these are the, the 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 facts that i can say uh, mr sunil abiratna i think uh, i have covered several issues so i would like to conclude my presentation Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ajit Rohan, uh, joining us uh, with your busy schedules. Uh, may I put one question? And you are in charge of the legal affairs, yeah. the police department. Um, do you satisfy with the the way the uh, that the police, uh, children and women's uh, bureau conducting investigations? And uh, are you satisfied with the speed mechanism applied by them? And what are the loopholes? And what are the areas you feel to uh, develop uh, to have speedy mechanism? the investigation especially in the child abuse victim yes i am not uh, 100% satisfied with uh, the existing mechanism i mean uh, i can confess but 90% of the officers who have been deployed to this field so they do they they uh, do their job uh, properly and uh, they are they have the capacity they have the capability but 10% of the officers so we are having problem with them so we are going to enhance the capacity and increase the number of officers with uh, i mean their skills so uh, and uh, in addition to that uh, we have a plan to develop uh, uh, improve the infrastructure facilities at territorial level especially um, the children and women bureau units so if a person if a, a child victim go to a police station to entertain a complaint in respect of child abuse case so he or she should not see uh, this particular place as a police station 
so it should not be a traditional i mean the place where the statement is recorded should not be a traditional place so it should be a place very i mean child friendly place so we are converting that environment uh, gradually do you have special training for special to that uh, women uh, police officers uh, then how to conduct the investigate because in a country like australia the police officers they have to get a friendly with uh, that small uh, children uh, when they carry out investigation do you have that such mechanism uh, adopted in sri lanka yes because before 2011 we didn't have uh, that type of mechanism so generally the general training was given to everyone including female police officers but we identified the system actually i am happy to say that i am one of the members of that committee uh, who designed the new trailing trailing uh, curriculums to sri lanka police we i mean three officers uh, were appointed by then inspector general of police mr nk ilanga kon and i was uh, heading the committee and we change the training curriculum of sri lanka police especially at the police college so the police college conduct uh, uh, induction training courses and apart from that police academy which conduct uh, uh, advanced training courses for uh, higher police officers so we uh, uh, were able to change both curriculums and apart from this conventional training legal law penal code we inserted um, Uh, we we incorporated several concept like counseling uh, stress management and interrogation techniques and child interrogation te- techniques recording statements uh, where all these uh, concepts have been uh, incorporated into uh, our training curriculums so therefore those training courses are conducted at police college and police in service training centers and uh, the police academy thank you very much uh, dr hadi tohana because you are uh, present sir uh, with your busy schedule so you are in the yes. middle of the battlefield uh, the covid 19 these days <laughs> so thank you very much oh uh, please uh, thank me to leave you uh, mr abhiratna because i have another program at 8 o'clock so i have to leave thank you very much once again uh, yes i think uh, there are some uh, uh, questions raised by uh, the one question uh, uh, dr ajit tohana the one uh, the what does uh, sri lanka police do to those officers found guilty of misuse of power against children who are victims and witnesses of crime do these police officers obtain special training and rehabilitation do they get reappointed in areas with dealing with uh, children directly there's a question uh, uh, dr ajit tohana ka, you can answer before your leave yes because uh, as you all know in 2015 our legislature has uh, introduced another act called victim uh, and witness protection act so accordingly uh, irrespective of the status he might be a police officer he might be an inspector it doesn't matter if he receive complaint or if he receive information we conduct investigation and uh, yes. deal with the law and we okay. i think there are two three uh, uh, we we have uh, t- uh, taken action uh, against two or three police officers uh, i mean uh, in respect of this particular issue so we are taking action irrespective of the status of the uh, police officers there is another one uh, quick question that, that uh, the supreme court gave a clear instruction for all law enforcement officers to follow when dealing with children as victims and uh, witnesses of crime why are the police officers continuously violating rights of children arresting children transporting children in vehicles uh, with adult criminals retaining them in cells with adult assaulting and verbally abusing children putting children who are victims of crimes in juvenile detention centers anyway that's a complaint of of course not a question and complaint yeah the doctor did uh, you can if you can give your explanation yeah i saw that judgment uh, actually uh, i mean the last year that was delivered by our some guidelines also uh, but uh, but uh, as i as i mentioned uh, 90% uh, of police officers so they adhere with rules and regulations and they do their prop, uh, job properly but uh, sometimes very few uh, police officers we have 90000 police officers in the country so very few of them so they might uh, i mean uh, do this type of errors or the negligences and on the other hand uh, i i i uh, confess that we have uh, problems with uh, infrastructure facilities so now and let's say now uh, um, uh, a 
police station uh, in uh, Mahawir, Ampara. So if they are going to court, so they have to go to Dehiyatakandi or Ampara, it's about 40 kilometers from the police station. Uh, then in the morning, if it is a, if there is a child, uh, I mean, the uh, perpetrator of uh, a child perpetrator and the other suspects, so they have to go uh, on the same vehicle. We know that. Uh, so, but uh, then we cannot send two vehicles <coughs> for 40 kilometers and that the infrastructure has, a, we are lacking of uh, infrastructure. But uh, I, I uh, agree uh, with the comment made by this particular uh, gentleman or lady uh, that uh, we need to have a separate vehicle actually to carry, uh, I mean, uh, juvenile offenders. Uh, yes, Doctor. Uh, I on the long list of questions are coming to me, but I think the time will not permit us to go. Ahead. But then I will put uh, some of these questions to uh, Mr. Harshan Anakara and Professor Vidhanapati, and I will get their assistance. Thank you very much, Doctor Ajit Rohana. Yeah, Our next uh, speaker is a Professor Mudita Vidhanapati, is the chair, the Professor of Forensic Medicine, University of Sri Jawadhanapura, has been appointed as the new chairman of the National Child Protection Authority. Professor Vidana Patirina was the first professor to be appointed to the Department of Forensic Medicine at the University of Sri Javadanpura. He has authored several books on science and has published more than 175 scientific papers. He was appointed the head of Department of Forensic Science in 2010 and has taken his department to great heights throughout the years. He has done a number of the research and publications um, today that he will address this gathering on the achievements of the National Child Protection Authority from a policy, implementation, and monetary perspective. May I invite Professor Vidana Patirna. Uh, very good evening, and I'm grateful and honored to be invited, and I'm delighted to speak a uh, few words about this uh, very important, timely uh, topic. And I, may, and I must uh, extend my sincere gratitude to uh, BASL as well as OPA for inviting me for this uh, very important uh, discussion. Uh, is it okay if I uh, share my presentation? Yeah, sure. Can you all see? Can you all see? You can, you can see. Yeah. So uh, this is uh, my uh, topic for today. Uh, achievement of the NCPA from policy, implementation, and monitoring perspective. Now, uh, it's very important to discuss our main function. As you all know, we have a very strong act, number 50 of 1998. Uh, Child Protection Authority Act of Sri Lanka. In that, we have been given very important two tasks. I have developed a small mnemonic, app.com. That means app is awareness, prevention, and protection. For that purpose, we have the national policy for child protection. The other one is COM, that is coordination and monitoring. This is also the main uh, the second function of the National Child Protection Authority. So first of all, I must uh, discuss very important uh, aspect. For example, uh, before talking about all other things, we must uh, talk about our head office and our uh, field officers. We must strengthen our staff at NCPA. We have 534 cadres, but uh, Currently, we have 368 staff members and 186 vacancies. Now, uh, if I compare the issues we had before 2020 and in 2020, I was appointed as the chair uh, by His Excellency the President on 1st of January this year. So uh, there had been only 30 officers who had been confirmed, nine from the head office and 21 from the field, only 30, that is about 10%. We have managed to get uh, our officers confirmed around uh, 210 now. Uh, in the next uh, board, I'm planning to get uh, 50 more uh, officers confirmed. 
So increments had not been given for last four years. It is up to date now. So uh, vacancies 186 are there. I have given uh, cover up uh, positions for 150 officers uh, and uh, uh, eight posts have been advertised currently. Uh, any interested person can uh, apply. Uh, very kindly, I invite uh, suitable personalities to apply for these very important positions. And uh, the remaining 180 will be advertised soon. Then uh, transfers. Some officers, they were traveling more than 150 kilometers in the morning and coming back another 150 kilometers, not only for one or two years, more than five years. None of them had been given transfers. So when I came here, now I have given the critically very important 13 transfers up to now. Then uh, when people retire or leave, the successor must learn from scratch. For that, we have developed uh, standard operating procedures for all seven units. Now, if a person goes or vanishes from our post, the successor will uh, start from the next day onwards. So uh, capacity building, we have arranged for next three years, every month, uh, three hour uh, continuous professional development uh, programs. Uh, for the head office, they gather to the auditorium and the field officers through Zoom, we pay 100 rupees for three hours for our Zoom participants. And voice package was given. It is 461 rupees, 1,000 minutes free for any uh, network, and 2 GB is free with this uh, 461 free of charge package for our field officers. Then uh, emails, not to their names, but for their position. So these phone numbers, as well as uh, emails will be permanent and forever. If we uh, put it up in a poster, that will be forever. So these uh, changes have been done up to now. With that background, I'm coming to my presentation. Uh, first function, for example, the, the our uh, main function is uh, uh, the policy for awareness, prevention, and protection. Uh, if you consider this, uh, our national child protection policy, it uh, covers uh, at four levels, that is national and universe level, then family and community level, then the child itself and the children who contact with law or break the law. So if you consider universal and national level, you know, as you all know, the child rights convention, then we have our uh, National Child Protection Authority Act, then we have our national child protection policy. It was uh, uh, accepted in uh, 2019, October 29. So we are in the process of developing the action plan for five years, next five years, 2021 to 2025. We are in the process of discussions with 12 stakeholder ministries. We have concluded uh, with four because of COVID, but a uh, little uh, longer. And we are planning to end in uh, uh, two months time. Uh, so our aim is to make a child friendly environment and to overcome uh, children from all forms of abuse. Then uh, if you consider the, the awareness and uh, prevention and protection uh, regarding child protection policy, the family and community level. So awareness and prevention for that, uh, since uh, we don't have uh, currently uh, national action plan for next five years. We are in the process of making, as I mentioned a little earlier, but we have annual action plans and even quarterly action plans. And we have been uh, developing uh, case studies, success stories from concluded cases. Uh, we have about 25 uh, university interns in our uh, unit and they are preparing lot of uh, such uh, success stories and this will be teaching material in the future and this will be used to prepare uh, child and law uh, uh, curriculum for uh, students in uh, schools from grade 6 to grade 13 in time to come. We are in the process of uh, discussions with National Institute of Education and the Minister of Education.
education and uh, build up to better target uh, before achieving that target. We are planning to reach uh, uh, FMN TV uh, channels and ask for 15 minutes uh, from each channel every week to discuss child and law. So uh, Shiksha, it is uh, one of uh, books uh, prepared by uh, Child Protection Authority. It highlights uh, positive discipline and is very important for uh, school teachers because uh, uh, psychological or physical harassment in schools have been uh, banned now from since uh, 2011. So uh, protection, if you consider referral, uh, we get a uh, uh, lot of complaints through 1929. It is uh, a toll-free uh, child-friendly helpline. It is 24 hours and uh, in all three languages, your identity will not be uh, disclosed to anyone. So you can freely inform us and we get direct complaints as well. Our fax line is 0112-77-8767. Our email is chairman ncpa.gmail.com and we you will be given a huge present in two weeks time. This is done by uh, Save the Children, with Save the Children International and National Child Protection Authority. This is called 1929 mobile app. You can, will be able to download uh, uh, from App Store or Play Store free of charge. You can give not only voice call, but a voice uh, message or text message or a video clip in the future. And these are first reports. Uh, whenever a case is reported to police station, they have to send uh, within 24 hours to uh, the National Child Protection Authority. We send a round of uh, reminders to all 494 police stations through IGP, and now we get regular first reports. And this is a yellow report we get uh, from Attorney General's department regarding uh, the indictment. So, uh, Further about family and community level, we have a SIT Savir. This is very important. This is National Child Centered Psychosocial Support Service. We have developed, uh, have bring down all the stakeholders in the country under one umbrella. See, this is uh, SIT Savir for Candy District. This is, see, all the uh, psychosocial officers and uh, the counseling officers attached to Women's Bureau and uh, Department of Social. Services, development officers, and counseling assistants, they all do counseling for children. And not only that, all the divisional secretariats in whole country, and not only that, the Mitru PSA contacts all have been listed here in each district and hospital mental health unit uh, in all the uh, areas in the country. So, uh, likewise, uh, Now, our psychosocial unit is in the process of developing uh, their success stories. It's called SARPASA. For example, if you consider, uh, these will be teaching material in the future. So this will be uploaded to our website. You all will be able to download freely. So uh, this will be in the public domain in very few weeks time. So uh, for example, under different uh, topics, these are what, uh, child development centers, daycare centers, even uh, uh, early childhood development centers, then uh, positive uh, discipline, then in disasters, then beach boys, then vulnerable, uh, uh, marginalized at risk and uh, invisible children, all these topics have been covered in Sarapasa. So these are very, very important to consider. More than 90 cases have been listed here. The other important uh, thing is now in the future, see, there is the current uh, the teaching material they have developed from our psychosocial unit. They include you know, all these success stories. See? So these are based on case studies. Therefore, there will be uh, take home messages for everyone. So, uh, economic 
issues for example samurdhi as you all know samurdhi authority of sri lanka is there but of the eligible only 41% receive samurdhi 59% of eligible does not receive and 59% of non eligible receive the other beautiful aspect is the selection cost is equal to beneficiary cost therefore this is i would say it's not a, not that much of a successful story for sri lanka therefore we propose universal child care benefit it's not a, a alien uh, concept it is being used uh, world over for example pakistan is using malaysia indonesia nepal all are using so this is irrespective of economy all the children should be given uh, some sort of uh, uh, remuneration for example 2500 per child irrespective of their income therefore there will be no selection criteria money will not be spent unnecessarily so social security for example there are disabled uh, 17 lakhs people are here of them 4 lakhs are dumb and deaf and dumb so the uh, children social social security board will look after them and we have huge uh, work uh, on behalf of them and legal issues are also there then uh, further we have uh, five units in uh, national child protection authority to look into criminal justice system work for example law enforcement authority under that uh, in each district as well as uh, divisional uh, secretaries we have uh, 410 officers up to now we have about 250 of them and then cyber surveillance unit this was initiated in 2001 way back uh, that time we didn't have uh, we didn't know about uh, cyber attacks but however that time it was called cyber investigation unit in 2020 uh, march i converted into a cyber surveillance unit and we brought down a consultant analyst and an investigator of cyber uh, crimes and now our surveillance work have overcome the uh, routine complaints for example for last 9 months our surveillance cases have been 52% of the total cyber complaints so video evidence recording units we have uh, we are have planned to uh, establish nine such units in uh, each province uh, we are planning to establish it in uh, hospital under uh, lama pierce then police units well, we have a separate police unit 35 police officers now uh, for example uh, this year we up to now we have conducted 46 such cases and media unit as uh, uh, dr ajit rohan mentioned uh, media investigations we have uh, even last week have informed few papers regarding their misbehaviors in publication and uh, action will be taken it's a legal unit also is very busy and psychosocial unit if you consider about the officers at divisional secretary there are 331 divisional secretaries in sri lanka child protection how many officers do you think it's enormous number you think you mention he is there minimum of 26 officers who work for children are there in divisional secretariat therefore we need to bring all these uh, officers under one umbrella and make use of them for example when we consider about child we have to identify vulnerable children now we are in the process of mapping gis mapping of these vulnerable children and then at risk children for example the, these vulnerable children can become at risk of getting pregnant or get hiv or sexually transmitted in- infections all this at last they can be marginalized and can enter to a, a institution like a child development center and economically socially and culturally marginalized and some instances they are invisible they look like adults so we miss them for example in a brothel house child may be working but we can't identify in a shop a child may be working as a, as a child uh, labor but we cannot identify so they are invisible children so uh, we have uh, uh, developed a special new form this is called the national child protection authority case conference evaluation report here they give uh, a clear uh, view about child protection this another name for this is child protection assessment 
reform. So this will be in uh, law in time to come. So uh, victimized children, for example, admit to hospital to prevent re-victimization. We uh, do clinical case conferences in uh, hospitals and Lama PSA. Uh, these uh, Lama PSA will be established in each province in time to come. And under that uh, roof, uh, there will be video evidence recording today, as well as uh, infant receiving center in the same, under same roof. This is uh, NCPA video evidence recording to prevent secondary victimization. Secondary victimization means by another second person to overcome that we always try to give to a reliable guardian these victimized children. They are uh, our child protection report and we give to parents under the supervision of probation officers or a trusted relative fit person. And we are going to, from this year onwards, uh, ODK monitoring will be done. Another important thing is to uh, alternative care centers, for example, child development centers, ODK monitoring will be done from this year onwards. So victimized children, might go to, straight away to police. Such instances we do video evidence recording. If they are not satisfied about local police actions, NCPA police unit will take over and investigate for. For example, as I mentioned, 46 cases have been done for this year now. First report, and we uh, monitor those uh, first reports and criminal justice system is. And as uh, Dr. Ajit, uh, DIE Ajit mentioned, we are in the process of developing child-friendly police and judicial procedures. We had an initial discussion with the Honorable Minister of Justice, and we have already planned and we have initiated, and those will be finished in six months' time. Then if we consider victimized children, child offenders, suspects can be sent to remand homes, 16 such homes are there, and we will be uh, monitor them for the first time. Uh, in ODK platform. Then uh, when sentenced, 12 to 16 years can be sent to certified schools and they will be monitored by, under ODK digital platform. 6 to 21 youthful offenders, those will also be monitored from this year onwards. Then alternative care, our second function is coordination and monitoring. For example, minimum standards, we have already developed 12 such minimum standards. Take for an example, school child protection committees to ensure uh, the protection of children of the children in schools will be, uh, we have already developed minimum standards. Minimum standards, child development center for Lama Nivas and for compulsory education school committees, this uh, from 2016 onwards, but uh, no such uh, committees have been because we haven't uh, uh, monitored them. So uh, daycare center monitoring and uh, minimum standards have been developed. And for early childhood development centers and uh, for child hostels, we have developed minimum standards. It's all digital platform. The, the caretakers can use these. They can finish uh, uh, handling these with less than one hour's time and take a self-evaluation and see whether they are, they are three-star or two-star or one-star uh, institution. And this is called the bottom-up approach. And they will be able to improve their uh, places. They're receiving homes, minimum standards, and the certified schools. And youthful offenders and children of fit persons, from this year onwards, we are going to uh, monitor as well. Those are minimum standards. Then monitoring, we have improved developed 11 ODK monitorings. We have had been doing only one monitoring, that is Lama Nivasa Child Development Center. Now we have improved it to 11, that is 400 to 50,000. For example, Child Development Centers, early Ch Montessori is 19,600. Compulsory Education, GN, Raman Eldaris have to center reports 14,022 people are involved and daycare centers 12,000, school child protection companies 5,000 fit persons. 
similarly, if you consider total monitoring will be 50,000. If you consider this ODK platform, so we have already developed this. See, we have concluded 390 uh, uh, child development center monitoring in two weeks time. This is beautiful. See the automatically developed uh, the map based on GIS. See the concentration, Jaffna, Kalambu, the, the, the Western province and uh, Eastern province, but hardly any uh, um, child development centers in Southern part of Sri Lanka. So we have a huge knowledge base now regarding this. The monitoring of school child protection all have been developed. Or we didn't spend even a rupee. One of our officers, Mr. Rohan, developed all these on behalf of our institution. Then if you consider how these are monitored, these beautiful, from their phones, they do it in no time. And they submit from the institution. So give me five minutes more. Then uh, rating maybe three green stars, two orange stars, or one red star. If they get one red star, those institutions will be revisited by a team in two weeks' time. If they get two orange stars, uh, those places will be revisited in two months' time. So this is a beautiful system. And uh, this, we don't uh, find fault with anyone. We give the report to the authorities and we request them to improve these places. So unless you monitor, there will be no development. So for example, if you consider that we have a special provision, the higher management can daily monitor all these systems. See, when I go to here, data of the uh, monitoring system, this is the child development center monitoring. When I tap here and uh, refresh, I get the current situation of the whole country. See, this is beautiful. So, uh, <coughs> CDC monitoring before 2020 and after January 2020, format was paper based, now ODK digital platform. Earlier it was subjective, now it is objective, for example. When 10 marks are given, it is divided. For example, slippery flow, two marks. If the, in the, in the analysis of bathrooms, for example, soap is available, two points. Clo place can be closed properly, two points. Then uh, uh, the, the showers, 20, uh, one for 20 students, uh, uh, children, then two marks. Like that, it's an objective questionnaire. Even in Northern, Southern, Eastern, Western, if even you do or I do, more or less the same mark will be the result. So expenses, earlier we spent 3,500 per each assessment. Now zero uh, expenses, that is 14 lakhs were spent last year, this time. So by, they have to send it by post in the past, now online. And after submission, we have to enter again. Now it's automatically. So analysis uh, now online. So assessment in the next year, for example, last year investigation, the final documents we received about months ago, but now we have concluded child development center monitoring. So review, as I mentioned, so coordination and monitoring. Now this is called a complaint update monitoring system. As you all know, we get uh, 1929 complaint. When they complain, we give a reference number. But after two, three weeks, when they inquire from us, we are clueless how to find the, the details, the current status of their investigation. Now, 
in the high management we have in our fold any time we can answer whether it's a close file or this current status of their investigation so these are called a complaint update monitoring system cubes these called uh, ncpa cubes and finally this is colis cubes that is the the first reports we get from police officers or police stations we monitor and uh, track all these investigations and the current status is with us now so this is a police complaint monitoring update system so a uh, final to uh, it's it won't take uh, one minute now if i analyze sri lanka police 2010 to 2019 child uh, complaints reported to them in 2019 5130 however we have received 2000 in 2008 8558 what's the difference in police stations they get straight away from the aggrieved party or their relatives or their guardians but here most of the time the bystander of the of a neighbor who other interests so for example when we analyze 2019 see 70% are sexual offenses when we consider the the offender see 50% are non relatives as uh, uh, professor jean highlighted usually it's by a relative but in this police investigations they say it's a, a non relative person 70% so what is the reason you when reporting 2016 says in sexual assault 60% are by a relative however another small finding the cases which have been reported in 2009 to police stations 50% had been taken place in homes the crime scene at all but relative had committed only 20% external non relatives had committed 80% so what is the reason now home is not a safe place so we have to look back to homes and as adults we have forgotten our responsibilities i would say home is no more a safe place for children so guardians and parents supervision is not sufficient thank you very much thank you very much uh, uh, professor vidana patirana uh, i will that uh, put this question i will expect a very quick uh, answer from you uh, professor vidana uh, patirana there, there are a number of questions supposed you because uh, some says that, that why this uh, national child protection authority is lethargic and various based on that uh, another question is there abuse is kept secret by the victim due to various reasons and abuse continues research indicates that this is an intergenerational issue the victim becomes the abuser later what measures are recommended to address this serious causal problem so in fact uh, this this issue cannot be uh, countered by the national child protection authority or police uh, force it should be as i mentioned universal and national level then community and family level and child himself he or herself should contribute for the prevention and protection of this these issues as you mentioned what the amount of laws we have will not uh, matter but uh, the the offenders are very sure you cannot identify some abusers by external features or the way they talk or the way they behave so people as friends or known people of the relatives and your parents they enter to your house but you must remember never allow your attention to be recent always keep thorough attention towards your children otherwise children will be uh, messed up by the external abusers therefore this is a collective effort even the media has a huge role in this regard 
Okay, thank you. Next question I will pose to Mr. Harshana Nanakkar. Uh, Harshana, the question is that there are a number of questions posed to you, but I have that organizers have picked uh, only one or two questions yeah. considering the time factor. Uh, how physical punishment, corporal punishment, and psycho uh, psychological aggression on uh, children is uh, defined within the legal system of Sri Lanka? And what legal provisions are available for sentencing such offenders in the justice system? Right. Okay. For part of that question, my video is not getting on. Switched on. I'm trying to switch it on. Yes, Probably okay. admin can switch it on. Okay. Yes. Right. Now, firstly, corporal punishment was abolished in 2005 by an act of parliament. Right. And then in 2006, I think government schools were also issued with a circular to stop corporal punishment. So strictly speaking, other private schools and establishments must follow the same. Why is corporal punishment bad? This would be very well answered by probably a psycholo child psychologist. But from what I have gathered, you cannot, you cannot punish a child with fear and then expect the child to correct themselves. There will be some aggression and hatred towards authority because most of these punishments take place, corporal punishment, without exactly telling or talking to the child as to why the child is receiving such a harsh punishment. Because corporal punishment is no way, physical punishment is no way to correct a child if the idea is to correct the child. So therefore, that's another big topic. But let me get on to other one. What about our legal framework? Our legal framework is what I told you. It has been abolished in 2005. They issued a circle in 2006. But whether it get implemented, whether it happens, is another question altogether. Now, we heard Professor Vidana Patrana speaking. We heard Dr. Ajit Rohan speaking. Right? Everybody is saying all the systems and things in place. I agree and I applaud all those initiatives, right? especially the NCPA. But the reality is that these things are not getting implemented at a ground level. This is the problem. And whether there's any legal background for this aggression, not really. There's no, 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 nothing, but it's, it's a, it's a psycho, psychological approach. And especially in this country, it's very difficult for the adults, especially some teachers in schools, these authoritative adults to realize that corporal punishment is, will only make the child more aggressive or far worse, hide their lie. You know, that, that's how it is. You have to reason out with children. So that's my answer to that one. And also, uh, uh, Mr. Abhiratna, there were two other questions that were raised in writing to me. Can I respond to them now? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. One of them is about my initial thing when I said there's no law protecting uh, domestic servants. Yeah. What I meant was this. Well, there are various laws. Some of them are very archaic and they have to be amended and updated. But say, for an example, if you take Shop and Office Employees Act, there are rules and regulations and monitoring. If you take the mines ordinance for children who are working in mines, there will be laws. Factories ordinance, yes. But domestic servant definition is not included in any of those acts. And the only domestic servants act we have was established in 1871. 1871, mind you. And that is also for the English to keep a track of their servants and not for their welfare. Okay. So what I'm trying to say is I just only gave that an example. My answer is that the child who's working in a domestic environment or a domestic servant, right, are not protected by any law other than the general criminal law. Because other places through employment, they do have some protection by way of monitoring. That is one question. The other question is that what about uh, the, our international obligations? Our international obligations are the ICRC, as Dr. Ajit Rohan has said, that we signed in 1991. Now, as you know, I mean, as, 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 as lawyers would know, I don't know the participants, there are what we call dualist countries and monist countries. A monist country is where the moment they sign an international treaty that becomes automatically becomes law and actionable in a court of law in that local country. But we are a dualist nation. That means we have to pass a corresponding law to honor those treaty obligations. But we have never passed any law in this country to incorporate each and every single provision of the ICRC or the International Child Rights Convention. So therefore, we cannot go to one of our courts and argue and say that our executive or some other state arm violated the right of the child. It has not happened here. But however, 
it is the signing of this in 1991 created a very positive impact on all the other laws in this country especially after 1990 the 95 amendment 2006 amendment they all define a child as a person under the age of 18 right but before 1990 most of the laws in this country have different ages for children dr ajit rohan spoke about the children's and young persons ordinance which was uh, brought, brought in in 1939 the other child is defined from 0 to 14 14 to 16 is a youth person so someone over the age of 16 the protection mechanism does not even apply legally in law right so as a result of which even if you take our constitution whenever we go to courts yes our courts have developed themselves to such a level that they are willing to take up an argument when we argue on a provision of the icrc but it is not direct law in this country where dr ajit rohan has said that it is not fair to compare the two countries with such a law and our laws well in one point what he is saying is correct but in another way you have to figure out how we deliver even some of our basics some of our basics my thing is if you have all these good systems in place everything is hunky dory as we say then the abuse and neglect cannot be on the rise but the reality is it's on the rise so yes some of them are social but what i'm saying to say is that as i said earlier preventive mechanism is the best and for prevention we must coordinate as professor jean prasad said at ground level we have to coordinate and this good concepts such as case conferencing with all the multidisciplinary approach are not a part of our law they have to be made into law you take the cypo dr ajit rohan said it has not been amended for well over 8 years why because the 13th amendment divide the child welfare subject to the provinces if you look at the children and young persons act cypo part of it is to do with justice juvenile offenders and justice the other part to do with care and protection so the central government cannot establish one law to encompass the provincial subject as well as a result of which all the amendments are getting blocked but i know halfway through there's a juvenile justice bill which has been drafted and been sent to the legal draftsman as well as now is doing tours between ag and legal draftsman i don't know the current status but that is actually we are separating juvenile justice from child welfare because it's a devolved subject so we have those kind of obstacles also to update our laws because some of them fall with the provincial government so uh, those those are the two questions that i had to answer i think i think uh, unless uh, there are other questions so anakar i think that uh, you are correct uh, uh, considering this uh, transnational laws of course there are some uh, differences but anyway that uh, this is due to some social problem anyway that sri lanka entered into the budapest convention cyber crime convention a couple of years back yeah. we are members of the that uh, convention Uh, there are more and more uh, that uh, the child abuse cases are uh, that reporting in cyberspace so this is high time as uh, we have international obligation uh, since uh, that we have uh, members of this high time to uh, introduce these articles because we don't need to uh, introduce new articles because articles are already given under cyber uh, cyber crime convention so these no, are i agree can say. i agree with you wholeheartedly i agree with you wholeheartedly at the same time you know in sri lanka as you and i as lawyers know our laws in book are generally very sound and good but it is the implementation that we are having problems with partly to do with resources partly to do with overworked police officers and government officers and what we need is more than the law a training of the attitudes attitudes of the caregivers or the state exactly. actors involved it's very important no law yeah. can fix an attitude it can only be done by training and i know that professor vidana patirni is a good man when he comes to training and giving the right guidance to people so let's hope he'll be very successful for the sake of children and um, for, for me the biggest problem is that no coordination at a ground level and ncpa is um, really suited well for the job of coordinating and monitoring and preparing policy which they are doing but all the systems are in place our thing is we need to get the results Okay. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Anakar. I have uh, yes, uh, this question. There are a number of uh, questions uh, again uh, to uh, Professor Jean Perra as well. Uh, may I put this question uh, question to um, uh, Professor Jean Perra? Is child abuse a psychological disorder of the offender? Is child abuse a psychological disorder of the offender? If so, would it be possible to identify such people before uh, committing a crime? <laughs> Uh, yes actually i am not a psychologist but then from my medical 
uh, background, what I can say is uh, some of them could be having psychological disorders. So those people can be treated. Uh, and because we know that uh, <clears throat> manic depressive uh, disorder and such disorders, uh, psychological disorders, they are treatable. They have the sexual promiscuity and then, you know, poor impulse control. Those can be controlled. On the other hand, not all offenders are having psychiatric disorders. So there are offenders who are psychologic, I mean, who are not suffering from psycho psychiatric disorder. So it is um, maybe, I don't know where they have, we have failed. Uh, so for them, there is no medical treatment. I hope that answers the question. Okay. Thank you very much. There are a number of questions still. I am getting some questions, but uh, time will train to that, uh, uh, put uh, these questions to our distinguished panelists. And thank you very much. Now, may I, uh, because uh, finally, because we have to say one thing, children are concerned. Today, a child, in future, he will be the adult. He will take over the administration, the control of the entire world. So therefore, we, it is our prime duty, irrespective of our profession, irrespective of our, the business or whatever it is. It is our prime duty to protect the children. This is our prime duty. Now, may I uh, invite Mr. Sujivala Dhanayaka uh, to make the, the pro proposed vote of thanks. And thereafter, that we can conclude this session. Uh, Mr. Sujivala Dhanayaka. Thank you, Mr. Abhiratna. Our valued invited guests and my dear friends, it is my privilege to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion. As you are aware, all children can be vulnerable by virtue of their young age and evolving capacities. They can be open to harm, injury, violence, and abuse. Therefore, protecting children from or against real danger and helping to reduce their vulnerability in harmful situations are very important. On behalf of the OPA Committee of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka, I express my profound and most sincere gratitude to you all for honoring our invitation. First and foremost, I thank uh, Mr. Saman Varsuitana, the president of the OPA, who despite his numerous and rather tight schedule, have found time to grace this occasion. I must mention my deep sense of appreciation for Prophet, Professor Mudita Vidana Bhatrana, Chairman of National Child Protection Authority, and Professor Jean Pereira, Senior Lecturer of University of Colombo, uh, for their excellent explanations of relevant topic, topics. Further, I am grateful to Mrs. Rosi Sena Nayaka, Mayor of, of Colombo, and Mr. Harshan Nanakar, attorney at law and uh, former legal consultant to the UNICEF for demonstrating their presentations. I may like to express our sincere thanks to Deputy Inspector General Dr. Ajit Rohana for giving an, a coverage on the area of practical issues on this subject. I also extend my thanks to our able moderator of this webinar Mr. Sunil Abhiratna, Senior Attorney at Law, uh, uh, who has given a lot, lot of encouragement. I thank the General Secretary of, of the OPA, Ms. Ruchira Gunasekara, for her assistance. Further, I would like to acknowledge our gratitude to all members of the OPA Committee of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka and the staff member. I would also like to convey our sincere thanks to Mr. Uh, Duminder uh, and uh, General Manager of the International Institute of Knowledge Management, providing technical assistance to make this event a success. I also extend my thanks to Lion uh, Vijit Manamperi and Lions Club of Colombo Rosmi uh, for their financial support and cooperation. Last but not least, I thank all the participants for showing their interest in this program. I once again uh, thank uh, everyone making this program a success. Thank you very much.
with that ladies and gentlemen we we'll conclude another successful webinar you know as you and i we are professionals in this world so we have the prime duty let's hope for the best good night good night